Okay. Can you hear me? Is this thing on? There you go. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk a little bit about getting to know the inter Internet of Things. Help explain what it is, how you can get started, and learn a little bit more. Uh, the term Internet of Things was coined by uh, Kevin Ashton. He's executive director of Auto ID Center, which is out of MIT. Uh, he claims that he kind of thought up the idea in a meeting with Procter & Gamble in 1999. So that would mean that the Internet of Things is probably at least 15 years old, the concept. And it's kind of taken that long for us to catch on and understand uh, the importance or how this is going to impact our lives. And it's interesting because downstairs there's a lot of those Ocular Rift 3D glasses. And we were trying those out earlier and we were talking about I, I remember vividly there was a virtual Game Boy probably 10, 15 years ago, which is exactly the same thing. So it's interesting to see how things come back in cycles. Uh, my name is Brian Suda, and I've been living in Iceland for a little over seven years now. And I've worked for companies like Nihedi, TM Software, uh, for Clara, uh, before it got sold to the U.S. And now I've got my own company called Optional.is where we're doing lots of small, uh, crazy, interesting projects. Now, one of the reasons I'm here today is I wrote a short story with some friends uh, called Spimes, Happy Birthday. And a spime is something that exists in space and time. So it knows uh, where it is, and it sort of knows its history. It knows um, who's used it, its metadata, how long it's been around, where it's been and when. And, you know, on Facebook and Skype and a few of these other services, you get uh, birthday mentions, like, oh, today is Yon's birthday. Um, there was a really good interview about where is that kind of creepy line where it's okay to wish friends and family happy birthday, but then it's like friends of friends, people from high school, people you've met once, like, where, when do you wish someone a happy birthday? So we thought about this and kind of put it in context of a story of Internet of Things. So rather than having this crazy utopian vision, we thought about what happens when every single device is telling every other device that it's your birthday. You know, what happens when my phone is reporting to someone else's phone? Even my shoes might be talking to other people saying, hey, it's Brian's birthday. So if you're interested, I encourage you to kind of read that. It's, it's fairly short, and it kind of goes through um, a day in, day in the life of the protagonist. And as you read it, you might think, oh, these are crazy ideas. We actually did a follow-up where we itemized, you know, this sounds like something silly, and it exists today. You know, none of these things are 21st century ideas. They're most of them you can get today. Most of the time, what I'm doing is data visualization projects, big data, crunching lots of numbers. Uh, this is an example we did for Price Waterhouse, where we're taking a lot of their corporate responsibility data and presenting it in an easy-to-understand way. What I'm excited about is the types of things on the, on the right side there. These are Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs. So these are Internet of Things devices. And what excites me about them is twofold. These little devices now can feed back into the dashboard. So one of the examples for corporate responsibility is the number of like, cups used. That can now be an Internet of Things device which feeds into this dashboard. But on the flip side, we can also use Internet of Things devices like the light bulbs as another screen, as a way to report things. Uh, for instance, uh, with the Internet, with the Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs, we can do things like uh, if you get an email, make the light bulb flash or change colors. If the share price is going up, fade it to green. If it's going down, fade it to red. So it can act much the same way as we visualize data for a dashboard on a screen. We can start doing it with these devices as well. So we'll go through a quick sort of history lesson of the Internet of Things to kind of get, get us grounded. The first message in the sort of proto-Internet ARPANET was sent in 10.30 p.m., 29th of October, 1969. And if we're talking about the Internet of Things, nothing can predate this. This is the beginning of the Internet. And we kind of thought to ourselves, if the Internet started in 1969, what is the first Internet of Things device? You know, if we don't count computers connected to the Internet, uh, those are just general purpose computing machines, what is the first very specific tool used purely for uh, the Internet? And I think, I think it's the ATM. And the ATM as we know it came around in 1972. 
And if you think about it, this is a device where you would stick your credit card in, request money, and it would go out over the internet, contact your bank, see if you've got the amount, debit your account, and send out the cash. I think we don't, we don't normally consider an ATM machine an Internet of Things device, but I would, I would claim that it's probably the first general purpose or speci sorry, specific purpose tool connected to the Internet. And that was 1972. Now, sometimes we hear the Internet of Things, and it goes by lots of different names. Smart sensors, smart dust, connected devices, smart devices, ambient devices, calm devices, a lot of device type of names. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as ubiquitous computing. Uh, wearables is quite popular at the moment. Things like your Nike Fuel Band or other devices like that. Sometimes it's referred to as portable computers, tablets, phablets, pods, pads, boards, and slates. So it goes by lots of different names. There is no concept of this is an Internet of Thing and this is not. There's, there's kind of a spectrum. So as we get to learn a little bit more about the Internet of Things, I'm sure a lot of people here are interested in how can I get started? What can I do? And the absolute easiest and simplest thing to do is this, this Wemo device. Uh, this retails for, I think, between 40 and 50 US. And you plug it into the wall, and then you plug your device into this. And this then connects to your Wi-Fi router. And from anywhere in the world, you can query this. So you can tell. Is the item that's plugged into it, is it my toaster, my lamp, is it on? I can turn it on, I can turn it off, I can query it for you know, electrical usage and stuff like that. And this is probably the easiest and simplest way to begin your home automation and Internet of Things, turn any device into an Internet device. But what makes it more interesting is services like If This Then That. The way If This Then That works is it's really simple recipes. If this happens, then do that. And Wemo is one of the options for that. So you can say things like, if I get an email that's marked important, then make my Wemo turn on and off. So it might be my lights in the house will flash. Or if uh, you know, my favorite football team score comes out, then turn the lights on. You can also connect it to your phone. As I approach my house, turn the lights on. As I leave the house, turn them off. So even with no sort of computer science background or anything, between the Wemo and If This Then That, you can build a really simple and fairly flexible home automation system. But if you want to take it up a notch, because I think a lot of people here are fairly technical, there's a DIY approach to actually build your own Internet of Thing. And you only need three parts to it. First part is the Internet. The next part is learning a little bit about hardware. And the third part is software. Now, the internet part is pretty easy. I mean, you can just pay Vodafone, Siemens, Nova, someone like that to get internet connection. This is a solved problem. We, we know how the internet works. We know how to get on the internet. We know how to use the internet. So the next bit, important part is the hardware. So we need to ask ourselves, do we build it ourselves or do we buy something? And there's lots of off-the-shelf consumer sort of things you can buy, to, like, like the Wemo, to turn your house and, or device into home automation. And if you're, not, if you're more of a software person, you can use some pre-made stuff. If you're more of a hardware person, we can start to either build it completely from scratch, or there's a few tools to help jumpstart it. The Arduino and the Raspberry Pi sell for anywhere from 25 to 50 US dollars. And it's got Ethernet built into it. And it's a fairly easy and straightforward way to get uh, much of the Wemo technology for, for cheaper. And it allows you to customize it and build your own uh, for your specific needs. So for $25 to $50, you can get started. And that's a very, very low barrier to entry. It's much, much easier now to get started on these types of things than it was five, 10 years ago. And it's going to get even easier as it goes forward. So once you've kind of got the, the board and the brains, what we need to think about is what's next. And these are things like sights and sounds. We need to start enabling the, the little green circuit boards with sensors. We need to be able to detect CO2, to smell, to, to see things, ambient light, temperature, uh, give it Wi-Fi or cellular connectivity, Bluetooth, RFID. These are all things you start layering up and building on top. And then finally, the last stage is sort of the software. 
And the great thing about the hardware-software combo is if you're more of a software person, there's lots of examples and specs and hardware that's pre-built for you. But if you're a hardware person, on the flip side, there's a lot of software uh, which you can download and just use a lot of libraries to make it easier. And as I go through a lot of the examples later on, we tend to see that the Internet of Things relies on this whole cloud platform, this layer above the device itself. And it really should be said that this is, this is optional. You don't need this sort of cloud platform. For some instances, it's very helpful and it's useful, but it's not requirement. So it makes it easier for you to either write or just use off-the-shelf off -shelf software. So the other thing that we really see with the Internet of Things is this concept of a big brain and a little brain. And we see this embodied fairly well with Siri and probably Google Now and a few other devices as well. The actual phone itself and Siri is the little brain. It's very simple and very stupid. You speak into it, it records what you've said, makes it a little waveform pattern, and sends that off to the big brain. The big brain does the hard work and crunches it, figures out what language it is, how you said it, blah, 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 figures out what you actually want, and then sends it back down to the little brain to actually do it. And this isn't a new paradigm. We've seen this with uh, dumb terminals and um, mainframe computers in the past. And now we're starting to see this replicated again with the Internet of Things. There's a guy, Scott Jensen. Uh, he's really, really big on the, the Internet of Things and how we're going to use it. And he used to work for Frog Design and Apple and a few other big companies. And now he's a big proponent of Internet of Things. And he always kind of touts this smart toaster. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I don't need a smart toaster. What am I going to do installing apps on my toaster? But this is what he loves. Because the smart toaster is a perfect example of the Internet of Things. He says, you can't evaluate tomorrow's concepts by yesterday's tasks. You know, of course a smart toaster doesn't need apps just like a horse doesn't need wheels either. We need to look at what smart means in a much, much more nuanced way. If I can unpack what it means to be smart, so even that the lowly toaster starts to make sense, then we can think about the Internet of Things in a much, much broader context. So he really likes to use the smart toaster as a good example. And he walks through these three concepts of I guess, smartness. And the first level is just simply discovery. You know, does the toaster report who the manufacturer is? Does the toaster even uh, report that it exists? So when you take out your phone, can you find the other smart devices in the room? Uh, once you found it, does it do other diagnostic things like tell you the last time it was used or how many times it was used? Very, very simple discovery type of information. We still haven't 100% solved this problem. But on top of discovery, then we get this idea of control. So now that I've got a smart toaster, how can I control it? Can I uh, automatically have the settings change? So when I'm using the toaster, the toast is set for three. But when someone else is using it, it's set for five or six. Uh, also, can I maybe customize it? So when the toast is done, it plays a little trumpet sound for me, but plays a different sound for other people. Then on top of control, we get coordination. And this is when does the smart toaster actually talk to other devices in the kitchen, other devices in the room, maybe other devices connected to the Internet. And this is sort of his three layers of smartness. And any one of these still qualifies as an Internet of Thing. You don't have to have all three. But beyond that, he begins to talk about categories of devices. So now that we define what smartness is, we need to talk about the different types of devices. And he, he uses his own metaphors. And he kind of thinks about these Internet of Things devices as, as animals. And at the very, very bottom, he's got this concept of bears. And a bear is something that's huge, big, monstrous. Uh, these are general purpose computers. These are your desktop machines, your laptop machines, even to some extent now your phone, because your phone is very uh, intelligent and has a lot of computing ca capabilities. And you can understand a bear because this is the type of thing, these have app stores. You're, you know, he's trying to bring in as many things to itself. He's trying to lock you in, uh, keep you within the same vendor, uh, have everything under the sun there. And we've known about bears, this concept of bears for, for many years. The next one he talks about is bats. And this is where the really interesting thing is coming in. Because bats are more specific use tools. 
These are things like the Nike Fuel Band. So all it does is record calorie count, um, steps, very simple things like that. This is BATS, and this is where a lot of the, the, the things you're seeing today as Internet of Things, and a lot of the examples I will show you would fall into the BATS category. Then finally, in the smallest category, he's got this concept of bees. And bees have been around as well for a long time. These are just tiny sensors. And in manufacturing, we've had sensors on motors, on devices, for quality assurance. These have been around for a long time. But it's only now we're starting to uh, connect them to the internet. So the reporting on the device is now uh, live and viewable in real time. So these are the three categories, bats, bears, and bees. So I want to go through a few examples of companies out there and products out there and kind of where they fit in uh, and show off their internet of thinginess. This is a little printer. This is uh, built by some friends in London from a company called Berg. And their kind of claim is that this is probably the first printer you want to want to keep in the bedroom. And it's a little tiny receipt printer. And all it has on the back is a power outlet and Ethernet. So there is no, you don't hook it up to your, your laptop. It purely is connected to the cloud and to the internet. And you, you, you go through your smart device and you give a lot of settings. You say, every night or every morning at 7 a.m., I want to print out a stream of today's tasks, today's to-dos, any meetings I've got. Give me a daily crossword puzzle and a photo of the day. And at 7 a.m., you push a little button on the top and it spits out a nice receipt with all these sort of information. And this thing can't exist without the internet. It, it, it is an internet of thing just because that's where uh, most of its big brainness comes from the internet. Uh, this was a Kickstarter project called Tile. Uh, each of these little tiles retails for, I think, about 20 US. And inside each tile is a tiny little Bluetooth um, emitter and receiver and a little tiny speaker. And what these do is you attach them to anything. In this case, this person's got them connected to a keychain, but you could put it on your radio, on your laptop, on your bicycle, anything. And when all of a sudden you can't find your keys anymore, you take out your smartphone and you say, I'm missing my keys, and your smartphone will tell you which direction and how far away it is based on the Bluetooth. And then if you want, you can even make the little tile beep if you can't find it. Now this in and of itself, it's interesting, but I know a lot of cordless phones and TV remotes will also beep when you can't find them. So that's not spectacularly interesting. But where the tile really excels is in the, the tile network. So every single person who has a tile registers it, but also registers it with a cloud service. So when you put a tile on your bicycle and you come out of the shop and your bicycle has been stolen, you take out your phone and you report that my tile is now missing. Every other single person in the tile network is not only querying for Bluetooth tiles of their own, but just Bluetooth tiles in general. So maybe someone's out on their morning run, and their smartphone will find your tile halfway across town. You'll get an email saying, hey, an anonymous tile user has found your bike. Here's the lat long. You can go pick it up. So it's a really interesting all of a sudden when these tiny little squares become this whole mesh across the internet where people can find and report things. All for $20, that's the most important part. Um, this is a company called Nest. Uh, on the left side there is their thermostat. This is a company started by a couple ex-Apple guys who designed the iPod. So they've taken a lot of care and, and knowledge into the design of this. And just recently they released their smart smoke detector which is also Wi-Fi enabled, connected, and talks to each other. And this morning, Lars was talking about um, Danfoss, the Danish company who handles all the temp temperature controls on the ovens. And he mentioned that there was a company that Google bought. This is them. This is Nest. Google paid 3.2 billion US dollars to buy this company. This company is less than four years old. So they're, they're creating about a billion US in value every year. I don't know the size of the team, but it wasn't huge. And to put that in perspective, 3.2 billion US is about 20 to 25 percent of Iceland's GDP. So a small team here in Iceland could come up with a very interesting Internet of Things device and sell it on for 10, 20, 30 percent 
of Iceland's entire economy. That's how hot and interesting the Internet of Things is right now. Now that uh, Nest has been bought by Google, there's some alternative smart smoke detectors out there. One is called uh, Hello Birdie, and it's a Kickstarter project that's going on right now. Uh, it's basically backed by a company in the U.S. called Highway One. And Highway One is an incubator for uh, smart Internet of Things type of devices, and they'll help you out. And they're backed by a much larger company who does manufacturing in China and just massive, massive scale of products. And they wanted to try and figure out how do we get into the smart market. So they started Highway One as sort of an incubator to uh, not only create these smart devices, but then help in the manufacturing. The other one up there, Sammy Screamer, is, is quite interesting as well. This is another uh, Kickstarter project at the moment by a company called Bleep Bleeps. And Sammy Screamer is really simple. It's just a motion detector. So it's about something you'd stick on your keychain. And on your smartphone, you can configure the sensitivity and the volume. So if this thing gets moved, it will send you an SMS or a push notification. But it also can do a little screaming. Um, but you should definitely check out the Bleep Bleeps website because they've got a whole family of these devices. And they're, they're, they're quite funny and hilarious because they're all kind of aimed at... Um, new parents, and uh, starting a family. The red one there is called David Camera. It's quite my favorite. Um, it's a baby monitor. So it's a video camera baby monitor, so you can see uh, how your baby's doing through your smartphone. The green one up there is actually an ultrasound kit. So if you're pregnant, you can have ultrasound at home uh, in, in privacy of your own home. And this isn't science fiction. This is something that you can order today and use, well, maybe not today, but you can order soon, and use on your, uh, on your smartphone. Um, this is a company, a new product called Mother. And on the right side here, it's quite washed out. This is the NASBA tag. These were internet-connected rabbits, probably from early to mid-2000s. And again, you could program these rabbits to do very simple things. Their tummy would light up, their ears would move, or they'd play a sound. And then you would chain that along with other things, like if you get an email, play a sound. If uh, your child comes home and the door closes, you can play a sound at your work, all these types of things. So the same company has reinvented it, this time called Mother. But Mother comes with these four or five little extra, uh, they call them pills, I think. And inside each of those pills is much like the tile. There's Bluetooth and a few bits of smarts in there. And one of their examples is you can stick one of these onto your toothbrush. And every time you brush your teeth, it's keeping track of the count. But it doesn't matter what it is. It's the fact that now we can very easily, with these little pills, start to internet-enable everyday regular devices, just like your toothbrush. This is a company called Bounce Imaging. Uh, they produce this little tiny ball with lots and lots of video cameras and additional sensors onto it. And they are going in the sort of um, military and first responder type of market. So I know a lot of Icelanders went to uh, Haiti when there was the earthquake there. Bounce imaging is a perfect example of, you know, you don't know if it's safe to enter this building. So you can roll the ball in there slowly, and it'll record in 360 degrees everything that's going on. Then on your smartphone, you can check out the infrastructure inside a building before humans enter. But there's also lots of sensors, so you can see it's detecting the carbon monoxide levels. Uh, are, there other, are there other dangers potential to the humans before entering into a fire or burnt out or you know, earthquake collapse buildings? But along with this Internet of Things, there are a few that start to worry me. I mean, the Internet is great. I love these type of devices. Um, but I do have some concerns. And the first one is... What happens when the companies stop? I mean, those Wi-Fi-enabled light bulbs, uh, one is by a company called Philips, which does home appliances, and the other one is called LifeX. And what if Philips says, you know, we're really good at making light bulbs, um, washing machines, these types of things, and we're not in the data center business. You know, data centers, we're losing money. It's not our core business. And they decide, we're out. We're going to turn this off. Now, all of a sudden, all those internet-enabled Wi-Fi light bulbs are just regular light bulbs now. 
then they still work, but you're paying 10,000 kroners per light bulb. That's really expensive. So this is one of the things that worries me is it's not up to me when the company stops. I mean, if I buy a TV, the TV works. If I buy a light bulb and then Philips decides we don't want to do this anymore, my, my purchase is being impacted. Also, <clears throat> selling devices is changing now. Because, like I said, previously, if you bought a TV or a phone or something, you own it. You, that's it. You've paid the manufacturer the price that they want, and then you're kind of done. But with things like this little printer, I might buy the printer, but now there's a reoccurring cost every month, every year, for them to keep their data center up, for them to push information to me. They've got bandwidth costs. They've got server costs. So where, where, who pays for that? <coughs> Is that rolled up in the initial cost of the device? Are we going to start seeing things like we're going we're to lease our toasters instead of buying our toasters? So every month or every year we pay a small fee to keep our smart toaster alive. And these are some of the, no one's quite figured this out yet, and it'll be an interesting challenge. And for people who want to get into the field, uh, it's also something to consider that once someone has bought your product, that relationship hasn't ended. And finally, the other thing that worries me <clears throat> is like now with a video camera or CCTV, you, you know that you're being recorded. There is a, a little red light of some sorts that says, you know, I'm recording this scene. But as these devices get smaller and smaller and are connected to the internet, how do you know when a smart toaster is recording your movements or recording the audio in the room? Uh, there was a book called Everywhere, which started to discuss, discuss some of these topics maybe 10 years ago. And they started to try and come up with some icons to represent you are in an area where your motion is being recorded or tracked. Or is it being tracked but not saved? <coughs> you know, are you entering into a recording field? So they were trying to think about these things and discuss these topics. So if you're interested in, these, in the Internet of Things, here's two good books that I would recommend. Like I said, Everywhere, I think that was written in 2006 uh, by Adam Greenfield. He's done a lot of really interesting work, especially at the smart sort of city scale. Uh, and then Shaping Things by Bruce Sterling. He's the guy who came up with the concept of spimes, the objects that exist in space and time. Uh, like I said, my name is Brian Suda, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around. We, I think we have some time now. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> I can try one quick demo, maybe. Let's see if this will work. Um, do we have internet here? There's the, the company who makes the virtual light bulbs. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, no, of course, not responding. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so this company, Lifex, let's see if this works here. This is their virtual light bulb. And um, normally you would download an app for the iPhone, which allows you then con to control your, your home lighting. But we'll see if this works here. But on the website, if we're connected to the same, play with virtual. Okay, so now I should be able to, maybe. No, it's not going to work. No. But then on the phone, you would be able to change, pick the color you wanted the light bulb, and the website would then react as well. Maybe we can reload. But it's, just, it's a good example for you to test these things out at home, you know, if you're interested in buying one, to see how it would work without having to pay for it. Uh, 
But yeah, then you can start chaining these things together, like I was saying. So if you come home, you can set the color of the light bulb and it'll automatically uh, change to your, to your whims. So, yeah. Any questions? I mean, uh, like the company who did the Nabatag rabbits, think that it was previously called Mother, or it was previously called Violet before it became Mother. And I think when they went out of business, yeah, the devices just stopped working. The tile I'm not too worried about because you're out 20 bucks. It worked great, so what? You know, a $100 light bulb, I'm much, I'm much more unhappy about that. Um, Hopefully, maybe we can get companies to write into their code of conduct, like if we plan on shutting this down, we'll open source the software and then you can run it yourself. Or I'm sure there will be lots of hackers out there who allow you to uh, just route it through your own server. Uh, like I said, in the software portion of the stack, I would hope that you know, the cloud isn't necessary. You know, like I said, if the light bulb company turns off their cloud service, the light bulb still works. Uh, and it's just kind of important to think about these things when you purchase the device and hopefully when the companies are building these, uh, keep that in the, in the bigger picture that they might not be around forever. So how do we uh, pass on either the software, the service, or open source it? I mean, that's also some planned obsolescence. I mean, every iPod is hopefully going to push the next one out. So. Yeah, open standards between the different, so one piece of software could control the different. Yeah. Yeah, Scott Jensen is big on, like, when it comes to the discovery layer, we need to push that down to the operating system and get rid of apps altogether. I mean, apps are one of these things that isn't going to scale. Like, you're not going to have an app for your toaster, an app for your TV, and an app for your car. This is something that needs to get pushed down even in lower. And you're right. I think uh, there'll be de facto standards on which internet light bulb will break out ahead. They might open source or release their API, and everyone will just copy that. But it's going to take some time. We're still in the very early days. That's the big question now. I mean, previously the Nest thermostat and the Nest um, fire, detect, fire alarm were super interesting to me, and now Google owns them. And you're wondering, why does Google want to know what I'm doing at home? So, I mean, that we've seen this, we're starting to see this already. Um, so it's probably going to make a lot of people question the device purchase. In some countries, maybe that's part of the, you know, you should be allowed to return it for a full refund if you don't like the new terms of service. I don't know. Uh, that's another thing. This is the really interesting gray area because previously we knew how to deal with that with software and previously hardware didn't have these problems and now we're starting to get this interesting mesh. And yeah, no one's really sure what's going to happen. And that's, I find that quite interesting. Any other questions? This is, yeah, this is very true. I mean, we talked about this with some friends of mine. Um, how do you upgrade your washing machine as well? Like, you're going you're gonna to set the firmware on the washing machine to, like, update it. So, yeah, there are definitely concerns. You know, you've got a massive network of light bulbs. If someone hacks the system and turns them off or turns them on, how do you do a software update? How do you protect yourself? Um, I mean, these are going to be, I mean, I bet you the answer to the companies is just 
buy the next version. You know, throw, throw what you have away and just buy the next version. I mean, we see this with routers. I mean, half the speed touch routers in Iceland are horrible for security. So the answer is just upgrade to the next one. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, it's going to be interesting. I agree. Or, or again, like the big brain, small brain, the, the little brain is going to be really, really dumb. And all the computing power is going to be in the big brain where the companies have all the control anyway. And they might be able to update it there. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know how many smart light bulbs have been sold, but if you take a look at Kickstarter, there's lots and lots of devices out there. I mean, I think we're sort of on that up ramp. Um, yeah, I, I, know, I don't know exactly what the plans for IP6 rollout are going to be, like, but the whole point is that we're going to run out of IP addresses and IP4, and as we're starting to give every device its own unique identifier, we're going to run out of identifiers eventually. So yeah, something to consider. Well, I guess the tile example is the tile isn't internet connected. It's just Bluetooth to the phone. Then the phone is what's connected. So there's a couple different paradigms for all these devices as well. Diane, a very good hand here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. As you said, we're going to be in Buin, and all of you thank you for the first time, and I would like to thank the Undibunis Nemt for the Undibunis Nemt for the first time, for the first time, for the first time, for the first time. Það verður eitthvað prógram hérna niðri, örugglega skemmtilega veitingar og annað slíkt. Ég kveit ykkur til þess að fara og líti kringum ykkur, þannig að þakka ég fyrir ykkur í dag.